Hello and welcome to the full Guilty Gear Strive character overviews video. This video contains guides for every character up to Season Pass 3. This will include strengths, weaknesses, toolkit descriptions, reasons to play, reasons to avoid, and more. If you're new to Guilty Gear, keep an eye on these sections of the screen, where pop-ups explaining move inputs and more broad concepts will appear. titular Guilty Gear himself, Soul Bad Guy is an aggressive, all-out fighter who strikes fear in the hearts of his opponents with his strong and well-rounded toolkit. Soul features a kit similar to a traditional Shoto character, but with a more offensive focus. His buttons, while shorter range than a lot of the cast, are extremely quick and hard to whiff punish, and reward him with excellent damage on hit and consistent scary strike throw on block. Of note is his Far Slash, a quick forward advancing mid that is plus 2 on block and cancelable into his highest damage frame trap, 5H, a wild haymaker that beats your opponent's life bar into submission and forces them to stand still, at which point Soul could use his exceptional throws to make them squirm and reinforce those frame traps. Soul's Wild Throw is a high damage unteckable command grab that side switches the opponent on connect. And Soul's regular throw, while seemingly just a normal throw, actually gives Soul enough advantage to go for a very powerful left right mix up that can be extremely tricky to defend against. In neutral, Soul tends to play the role of the aggressor, but his kit affords him a lot of ways to do so. Soul has a quick and consistent dash block, letting him safely get in on zoners, many fast moving special moves that can let him swing in for a surprise counter hit in the blink of an eye, a long reaching poking tool and success to keep opponents from getting too comfortable at the mid range an excellent whiff punisher in 6H, and amazing air mobility options such as Bandit Bringer, a dive kick that can be held to extend its duration and mix up its timing, making it exceptionally hard to anti-air. Soul is also a monster on defense, as his Volcanic Viper allows him to become completely invulnerable immediately and escape out of pressure, and his 5K is tied as the fastest normal in the entire game at 3 frame startup. A key trait of Soul's toolkit is adaptability. His low whiff recovery normals allow him to counter poke safely, his fast mobility options let him swing in quick, his normals let him play neutral competently with almost every character in the game, and overall he has a lot of room to adjust his playstyle in the middle of the match if what he was trying before wasn't working. Soul can struggle to get in against characters that have good screen coverage and has to put himself at risk to go for mix-ups, but these downsides are very much avoidable in the hands of the right player. If huge hits, an adaptable kit, and scaring your opponent to death is your thing, that Soul Bad Guy, the Flame of Corruption, might be the right character to kindle your fire. Kai Kisk, the first king of Illyria and the rival to Soul Bad Guy, takes a different spin on the Shoto archetype than his hothead in law. Where Soul zeroes in on ruthless pressure and offense, Kai instead takes a step back and refines a more distinguished attribute, one fitting of a king. Absolutely disgustingly good neutral. Kai Kisk is the king of Illyria, and the king of the neutral game as well. Kai's numerous ranged pokes all have great range, speed, and are notoriously hard to whiff punish. In addition, Kai is able to get clean and consistent knockdowns off of these stray neutral hits thanks to stun dip, and on block, he can cancel into his stun edge or direct clap to safely push the opponent away and apply the shock state debuff to them, making all of Kai's special moves deal increased chip damage and have stronger properties on hit and block. As mentioned, Kai's buttons are good. His 2S is a fast, long-reaching low that checks the opponent's movement like a charm, and his far slash complements it perfectly by having shorter range, but better dash momentum preservation, faster startup, and a longer disjoint suitable for counterpoking. Kai's 6H is a slow but reliable tool in neutral that crushes 6Ps for massive damage near the wall. And his own 6P is a high-class counterpoke for mids and aerial attacks. 
Kai also has a very reliable ground and air fireball that keeps opponents from getting too comfortable from a range and coaxes them into making critical mistakes that he can exploit. Finally, Kai has Stun Dipper, and let's be real, if there's one move you're playing this character for, this is it. A fast, advancing low that goes across nearly half the screen and scores a soft knockdown on hit. Doesn't sound too impressive on paper, but in practice, Stun Dipper is one of the most oppressive, defining neutral tools in the entire game, and stands as a consistent looming threat for the opponent every single step they take. Now, I'm sure you already understand that Kai's neutral is good, but what if I told you we haven't even scratched the surface of how terrifying this character can actually be there? The truth is, I've only told you half the story, because Kai's neutral on its own is strong, sure, but with 50 meter, you might as well be facing down a god. Stun Dipper goes from being a strong but low damage neutral check into a full combo or pressure starter from anywhere on the screen with 50 meter. His average reward pokes now can take you from corner to corner with either his exceptionally versatile RC combos or his Ride the Lightning Super, the super with the single biggest corner carry in the entire game. And coolest of all, if Kai is low on health, he can activate Dragon Install. Dragon Install is a powerful buff that lasts the entire rest of the round and grants Kai power-ups to every single one of his special moves. DI Kai threatens everything normal Kai does, but with higher damage, better offense, better neutral, better everything. However, it can be incredibly tricky to find a situation where you can both enter Dragon Install and not immediately die for it right after. Outside of neutral, Kai's defense is also strong. He is a DP like Soul, but no overwhelmingly strong mashout option like Soul's 5k. Unfortunately, Kai's biggest weakness is his offense. Kai lacks strong mid-screen damage like Soul has, has no naturally plus normals outside of 6k, a slow and admittedly gimmicky block string reset, and doesn't have an exceptionally powerful throw or any meterless mix-up options to make the opponent really want to mash on his frame traps at all. His Oki is serviceable. After a knockdown, Charge Stun Edge allows Kai to get an enforced standard strike throw free, but there is little incentive for the opponent to not simply block Kai out and return the neutral meaning if Kai wants to keep the advantage, he must go for shimmies and frequent throws to make the opponent scramble on defense, all of which could easily end his turn if the opponent guesses right. If this doesn't bother you, then Kai Kisk is an exceptional pick thanks to his best-in-class neutral and strong defense, and with powerful checkmate tools like Stun Dipper RC, you'll be sure to shock your opponent when you slide across the screen for a quick and easy victory. <laughs> themselves they blame the beasts May is the adorable, sea-life-loving first mate of the jellyfish pirates, and her peppy personality complements her toolkit almost perfectly. May as a character is built around two things, mobility and damage. May's kit is centralized around her Mr. Dolphin specials, rushing special moves that send May flying across the screen ready to attack anyone in her way. This special has incredible speed, deals solid damage on counter hit, and lets her set up threatening RPS on block. May can choose between a horizontal and a vertical version, making her approach angles very tricky to read. If you're worried about Mr. Dolphin being a bit too linear of an approach option, don't worry. The first thing all good riders learn is how to bail. May can leave the Dolphin on the ground with whiff, stopping her momentum which is great for baiting anti-airs and important to her pressure game. She can also leap into the air with split, which lets her hop over and punish attacks directed towards the Dolphin and grants her access to powerful mix-ups after a knockdown. Turns out, having a full-screen rushing special move that kills you on counter hit available at any time you have back charge is actually pretty strong and makes it really hard to play against her, even just standing there. And her 5H serves as an incredible counter poke to stop opponents from pressing buttons into the way of where her dolphins might be heading from. May can also convert into soft knockdowns from almost all her pokes thanks to 3K being fast enough to combo in from jabs and her kick normals. But even then, that's not all May has to offer. May has, without a doubt, one of the best jumps in the game, with insane height, speed, fall speed, air stalls, and air normals. 
Her JD gives her what can basically be seen as infinite extra double jumps that she can use for as long as she can stay up in the sky. JS is a great approaching air normal that beats almost every anti-air in the game, including 6P thanks to its low reaching hurt box. JH is a huge air-to-air -air swing that stops anyone trying to meet her in the sky, and J2H stops her momentum dead for strong left-right mix-ups and variations on her landing position. May's offense is not just strong because of the threat of high damage, she has some incredibly potent offensive tools to help her get those hits too. Her close slash is incredibly plus, builds lots of risk, and sets her up to frame trap with a number of different attacks. From almost any normal she can frame trap into 6H, which is her big damage dealer. This is an anchor swing that can be released early to frame trap the opponent, or held to guard crush them and reset the block string with some plus frames. If she's out of range for this, no worry! Mr. Dolphin Horizontal also serves as a reset and frame trap tool, with the S version frame trapping off any hit and the H version being mashable but leaving her at plus 7. Both of these moves, as in the theme of the maze kit, kill your opponent on counter hit, so they better not be wrong! As if all that wasn't enough, May also has a high damage and command grab that nets her a combo on hit. If May ever finds herself out of options on offense, no worry, she has a number of eject buttons including Mr. Dolphin Vertical, her jump, and her incredible backdash to proc the opponent into starting to move again, at which point, return to neutral and rinse repeat. Really, the only thing of May's you could call a weakness is her reliance on RPS. Most of May's offense can be interacted with by the opponent, and if May gets the answer wrong, they get out for free. But, uh, then again, if May is right, they take way more damage than she ever would have. So, I'll leave you to fill in the details. May can also do less damage on normal hit than average, needing meter, a counter hit, or the corner for her cash outs. But, again, you've seen what her cash outs look like. Hardly an issue. If you don't mind rolling the dice every now and then, and find it cathartic to watch your opponent's jaw drop as you turn their life bar to dust, May is the perfect character for you. Mankind knew that they cannot change society, so instead of reflecting on themselves, they blamed the beasts. Axel Lowe, Guilty Gear's resident zoner, is a cunning fighter who'd rather keep his distance from the opponent than get up close and personal. For Axel, the name of the game is Screen Control, and boy does he have it in spades. Axel's normals cover wide areas of the screen and reach farther than any other buttons in the game, allowing him to attack the opponent from way outside of the range where they can fight back, forcing them to get aggressive and run directly into the source of the danger. Luckily, Axel has more than his long-range normals to keep these opponents at bay. He also has incredible mid-range tools in his K-normals, an extremely quick far slash, and Rainwater, a backflipping special move that deals great damage to any opponent unfortunate enough to run into it. These tools help Axel keep an opponent who gets up to that mid-range scared of his neutral presence, and if Axel successfully lands a hit at any of these ranges, he can convert into simple knockdowns using Snail or Rensen to deal a little bit of damage and push the opponent back to full screen to try again. Axel's Rensen is a dominating tool at full screen, which forces the opponent to take some chip damage and eat risk before starting their approach, making each of Axel's mid-range hits feel more impactful, and its follow-ups can mix up an opponent that might be too gung-ho on getting in, using Rensen 8 to catch a jumping opponent, 2 to catch an opponent who swings themselves at you, Winter Cherry to catch a dashing opponent, and Delayed Winter Cherry to do extra damage and chip to one who stays put. On top of that, Axel has a full screen command grab that he can use once he's conditioned the opponent to block Rensen on a full screen wake up, but the command grab is slow and as such shouldn't be used frequently. Now, you might think Axel's weakness is his defense, but you'd be wrong. Axel lacks a DP, sure, but his 2k is the single strongest 5 frame in the game and has incredible speed and low profile, making it quite tricky to run offense against the guy. So, surely it's his damage then, right? Nope. 
While Axel's damage is low off long range hits, Axel can pull off some incredible numbers off of hits such as Rainwater or any jump cancel normal near the corner thanks to his strong Rainwater and Bomber loop combos. Is it his offense? Well, sort of. It's true that Axel doesn't have amazing offense and can be blocked out pretty easily, but what does Axel care about his block string ending and him going back to zoning you? If he wants you close, he can use Rainwater to reset with plus frames, and his JH with meter can be used as a quick overhead to catch crouching opponents. You see, Axel's real weakness is commitment. When I was explaining Axel's normals, I wouldn't blame you for asking yourself how could Axel not just be better than Kai in that regard. They both want to control the neutral, and Axel's moves go much farther. Surely that's just better. In some degrees, yes, but where Kai excels that Axel struggles is commitment. Kai's normals are not only quick to start, but quick to recover. Axel has no such luxury. His buttons have some of the longest total duration in the entire game and are all very disadvantageous on block, meaning one good callout on Axel's next move can give the opponent the opening they need to hit him and win the round. While this weakness can initially be hard to overcome, the power of Axel's normals cannot be understated. If you want a character who zones in style, keeps the screen under his control, and punishes anyone who dares approach with reckless abandon, then say hi to Axel Low. Oh well, Andy is a time stop super. You know you think this is sick. Chip Zanif, the Godspeed Ninja, is a pixie character who prides himself on being a jack of all trades, master of most of them. Chip excels in his speed in particular, sporting the fastest dash in the game, a triple jump, a wall run, two different dive kicks, and an incredibly quick air dash. All of this makes it extremely difficult to challenge Chip in neutral and catch him as he swoops across the entire screen like a hawk, or alternatively, a particularly annoying fly. However, this fly bites, and he bites down hard thanks to his exceptional offense and consistent reward off the openings he secures. Chip's 5k is one of the game's most egregious pressure tools as it's allowed to chain into itself, cancel into many strong frame traps, and leave minimal gaps when adding micro dashes into the mix, making it extremely hard to escape even layer one of Chip's pressure. Once you get past the 5k and the frame traps following, Chip has a series of rekkas that keep the offense going for additional resets or frame traps, and the only way out is to somehow guess exactly which one of the multiple reset choices he'll try to steal his turn back on, or call his bluff and block the entire string out. But wait, there's more! Chip also has Gamma Blade, a challenging to react to plus on block reset tool that makes all of this even scarier, and a ton of mix up options that can be done from pressure such as his command grab. His alpha blade, which hits cross up, and his incredibly fast dash throw. Once Chip gets a hit and scores a knockdown, his offense only gets stronger, as now before you do all of that you have to hold an unreactable mix up or two thanks to his ambiguous cross up air dashes and unique wall running mix ups. It only becomes more scary when you consider that Chip builds meter extremely efficiently and can spend it to convert almost every one of these hits into a corner-to-corner -corner wall break. Chip's neutral is also excellent due to his incredibly high dash speed and fast normals, making him a champion whiff punisher, and even if he's late, he can still apply pressure on block with his reckless. He does have a unique weakness in neutral that should be mentioned, and that is his struggle with fast low attacks such as a good low profile 2k. Chip's long-range counterpoking normals all either get low-profiled, or are slow enough that unless Chip gets a good read on the opponent, they will likely end up being able to block the incoming attack, meaning Chip has to rely on quick whiff punishes or air approaches to beat these attacks, which is easier said than done considering the low recovery that is typical of a crouching kick. On defense, Chip also excels, sporting both a 3-frame and a DP, just like Sol. All in all, Chip has excellent offense, defense, neutral, combos, and mobility, 
but lacks one important thing that keeps him from being completely overpowered, HP. Chip has the single lowest base HP in the game, and a few of his key tools put him at risk of eating huge combos. His DP is massively disadvantageous on block and counter hit recovery, and his Gamma Blade can be attacked by the opponent. What does that mean? Well, Chip can be hit by an attack while doing Gamma Blade. The Gamma Blade can also be hit by an attack. So, this is what that means. If being an absolute unstoppable powerhouse that dominates the game until you're swatted like a fly appeals to you, then learn the ways of the ninja with Chip Sanders. He's big. He's slow. He's deadly. He's Potemkin. And if you've ever seen a fighting game before, you already know exactly what Potemkin does. Potemkin is Guilty Gear's staple big body grappler, a character archetype that sacrifices mobility for crushing offense and the most powerful strike throw in the game. First thing you gotta know about Potemkin before we go any further is he doesn't have a dash. Like, he just cannot dash like the rest of the cast. Ground or air, it's a no-go. He has to walk everywhere, or use special moves like Hammerfall or Megafist to gain space. Additionally, his buttons are quite slow and tricky to use effectively, making him generally feel uncomfortable until he gets his hit. What sets Pot apart from the rest of the cast, however, is that when he gets said hit, it doesn't matter when, what, or where that hit was, the game could be over within the next two seconds. Potemkin has challenging, yet rewarding to learn combos thanks to his 6k, which allows him to Kara cancel into any special move for an added boost in forward momentum, which lets him utilize advanced combo routes, get Oki off things he otherwise wouldn't, and, uh, oh, do this. Potemkin can also use Heat Tackle to get hard knockdowns off of mid-range pokes, further increasing his threat level in neutral. Once you do finish that combo and the opponent touches the ground, they experience fear like nothing else as Potemkin uses Garuda Impact, an insanely plus chip damaging guard crush to safely force them to stand still and hold his incoming mix-up. They then get one chance to guess for their life before Potemkin ends it prematurely with either a high damaging frame trap or his Potemkin Buster, the single most damaging command grab in the game. Potemkin also has a slew of frame traps and resets to keep the opponent stressed even if they just block him, as he can end block strings with FDB to frame trap or go into Garuda to force that strike throw. Potemkin also has very high damage hard callouts to every defensive option that can be used to beat Potemkin Buster, such as 6H, which will smack a backdashing opponent for full corner carry and a combo, and Heat Knuckle, which will drag the opponent back down into his loving embrace if they try to escape with a jump. While Potemkin's neutral can be a struggle, he has the tools to make up for it, such as FDB, a flicking attack that can reflect projectiles at the opponent, or Slidehead, an armored full screen low that secures a hard knockdown on hit. These tools make it so Pot is never truly helpless against any powerful zoner, and makes him a consistent threat. With Burst, Pot has access to White Wild Assault, which is a frame 9 invincible, plus on block rushing attack that can be used to steal his turn in neutral in the event that he's outpoked. With Meter, his neutral becomes a lot better thanks to Hammerfall RC, allowing him to armor through an attack, then cancel his usually punishable on block Hammerfall into a powerful plus on block pressure. He also gains access to Gigantor Kai, a giant energy wall that goes across the entire screen and practically ensures Pot gets at least one chance to make you block. Hitting someone in neutral can be challenging for Pot, but thanks to his high health and strong win condition, he can afford to lose some interactions before running the opponent over once he gets his turn. So if you don't mind having to play a little patient and waiting for your turn to play, but you do like putting the fear of God into your opponents once you get there, you may want to bulk up with Potemkin.
strange, the confusing, the frightening, the absurd. These are the things that Faust calls his own. One of Guilty Gear's most divisive characters, Faust is a neutral-oriented character who relies heavily on his What Could This Be special move, which pulls out an entirely random item from a set list of items that all affect the match in some way. Faust's items are the cornerstone of his entire kit, and enable all of Faust's most powerful options. He can use his items for a number of creative ways, whether it's screen control, offense, defense, set play, combos, he can surely use an item to switch the situation into his favor. Becoming a Faust player is all about learning how to use these items effectively, as every single one of them can be used to help Faust in some way, but they are all equally as capable of hurting Faust if lost sight of. Faust's kit is naturally synergistic with these items, with examples such as normally slow and disadvantageous teleport, turning into an instant, completely unreactable cross if he has an item about to damage the opponent, a command grab that can swipe the opponent right before they would have blocked an item and place a dangerous debuff on them, and strong poking normals to keep the opponent back as he continues to fish for the right items. While it may seem a little too hard to plan for item usage when you don't even know what you'll get at first, Faust actually has a way around this. Faust can eat the item he pulls after pulling it, storing it for later use. This way, while the item is still completely random, you'll know what's about to come out when you launch it later in the match. This can force powerful item combinations and help Faust set up situations that guarantee him access to usage of his more powerful items. Faust's kit works without items, having long-range buttons to control space and neutral, a powerful dive kick to mix up his ground and air game thanks to its incredibly quick activation, and a number of simple yet effective frame traps, but it can't be stressed enough how important items are to enabling this character. Pretty much everything Faust has is a little weaker than what a standard character might, but the items throw in an aspect of chaos and absurdity that can push him over the top in the right situation. Your core principle while playing Faust should be situational awareness, as I can't stress enough how important it is to keep track of what's going on on the screen. Of note is Faust's Afro, which is a debuff applied from an item or from his command grab that makes the opponent's hurtbox taller and strips them of their upper body invuln from anti-air attacks, allowing Faust to hit dangerous fuzzies. After the afro is applied, if whoever has it on is blocked or hit with a fire move, the afro will explode shortly after, allowing for added pressure on block or a bigger combo on hit. Additionally, the afro can be used to enhance love, Faust's air projectile, to make it travel across the ground and guard Chris the opponent. Other important items to watch out for would be Mini Faust, a small unit who walks randomly across the screen and when touched, becomes enraged and lunges at the opponent making him great for screen control as well as sneaking in a mix-up between his fiery hitbox and the jump. Meteors is Faust's jackpot, hitting almost the entire screen with raining guard crushes from above and allowing Faust to teleport for a risk-free mix-up during the shower. Trumpet is a collectible item that sends an army of mini Fausts running across the screen that will lock down the opponent for extended combos, which can be amazing for Faust. But the trumpet can be picked up by the opponent, which will send the army after Faust instead. If you enjoy the idea of an incredibly adaptable and versatile kit that will keep you constantly guessing, and don't mind occasionally low rolling on item luck, then the doctor is in, and Faust accepts all patients. Rage. Melia is Guilty Gear's other staple pixie character, and while Chip is a jack of all trades, master of some, Melia is more of a jack of some trades, uncontested, wrathful god of destruction in the air. Melia's entire kit revolves around her air game. She has an excellent jump, two air dashes, some of the best air buttons in the game, excellent reward offset air buttons, a fast fall, a disjointed leap that beats anti-airs, 
plus on block, and changes her jump trajectory, allowing her to bait out the opponent's attempted anti-air. Trying to meet Amelia in the sky is hopeless, and catching her from the ground isn't much better either. When grounded, Amelia has excellent pokes such as her Far Slash, which clocks in at an absurd 9 frame startup, is nigh on whiff punishable, reaches for round start, and grants her combos on counter hit. She has some workable grounded reset and mix up options like Mirage and Iron Savior, but Amelia generally needs to hit you in neutral to begin her offense. That being said, once she does that, she is a nightmare and a half to defend against. Amelia knocks you down, sets tandem top, and then there's more of a chance you get hit by a mix-up than block it. After using Tandem Top, Melia can represent four-way mix-ups with highs and lows on both sides, double cross-ups, throws, instant overheads, resets, pretty much everything you could want and more. To make it all the better, off the right hits, Melia can route her combos to knock you down again and force you to hold the same mix-up once more. If you do defend against Melia's mix-ups, it's not a punish, but a return to neutral meaning Melia can just take back to the sky and try again for another hit. Generally, these mix-ups are extremely strong, but reward Melia with less damage on hit than your average character. But when you're putting the opponent in a 92 and 1 fifths way mix-up, that doesn't tend to matter all too much. And to top it all off, Melia has Bad Moon, which is a risky, but completely unreactable instant overhead that she can combine with 50 meter to score a combo whenever she really feels like she needs the hit. Similar to Chip, Milia's health is low, but not quite as low. She also doesn't have any exceptional tools on defense outside of her strong jump to get out of pressure, but that alone can be enough to invalidate a number of characters' pressure strings. Her other core weakness is wall break troubles. Milia doesn't get great offense after even a super wall break, meaning if you aren't able to reset the opponent, you'll likely need to win neutral again one way or the other, which can make wall break a serious issue for her. Hitting your opponent three or four times on a mix-up only to be matched in damage by their one hit can be frustrating, but if you don't mind being out-damaged and prefer throwing your opponent straight into the blender as opposed to just nuking their life bar then and there, then take to the skies with Melia Rage. Zato-1 Zato is a very unique character who makes use of his living shadow, Eddie, to define his toolkit. Eddie acts as an extension to Zato's kit, and is managed through a number of different techniques that can make the character initially challenging to understand, but incredibly effective once mastered. The bar next to Zato's tension gauge is the Eddie gauge. While Eddie is summoned, the bar slowly drains, and whenever Zato commands Eddie to do an attack, the bar also drains. Zato can command Eddie in two different ways. One, he has special moves that activate each of Eddie's four attacks. However, Zato's depth truly lies in the second activation condition, Negative Edge. If Eddie is not currently performing an attack, whenever Zato releases a button, Eddie will perform the special correspondent to that button. This means Zato can press a button earlier in the match, summon Eddie, then release the button to command Eddie without having to commit to any startup, active, or recovery from his own normal. This is incredibly strong for a multitude of reasons, and each of Eddie's attacks can be used in tandem with Zato when released with Negative Edge to give him a truly inescapable offense. If Eddie is forcing the opponent to block, Zato can go for multiple plus on block mixups that all score full conversions on hit thanks to Eddie being there to cover Zato while he's recovering from said mixup. Sato also has a powerful momentum shifting overhead in JD that can be used to force 50-50s in an Eddie block string, a command grab that gives Eddie Gage back on hit, and cross-up setups using Break the Law to keep the mental stack up. Eddie also defines Sato's neutral, as he can be manipulated in offensive and defensive ways thanks to a pose, a wall that blocks for Sato, allowing him to attack safely from behind it and there are multiple options to catch movement such as Frog, Pierce, and Drills. Sato's main weakness is his lackey kit without Eddie. If Eddie times out or is killed by the opponent, Sato needs to rely on mediocre frame traps with low reward on offense and a slightly small kit in neutral. 
Sato maintains all his normals, which are all a little worse than average, but he also keeps his unique flying mechanic. Sato lacks a double jump and instead can air dash in any direction, then after the fact, continue flying around, making it extremely hard to predict when and where he will land. This mechanic gives Sato a fighting chance in neutral without Eddie, but in the event that his fly is caught, Sato will be thrust back onto the ground without Eddie and will be forced to block the opponent's incoming offense. Sato has an excellent mash tool in 5P, but outside of that, his reward on defense is very low and his health is equally as low. Sato is also one of three characters to lack a reversal entirely, be it metered or meterless, so when Sato blocks, he's gonna be there until the opponent turn ends. Zato truly puts all his chips in one basket, having the best offense in the game when he takes advantage with Eddie, but ends up sorely lacking when his best buddy goes away. If the idea of a technically challenging character who loses a lot from simple mistakes, but gains unbelievably strong benefits from playing good suits you, then put on your edgy Walmart graphic tee and unleash the darkness inside of your soul. Ramlethal Valentine, the emotionless Brigadier General, daughter of the Universal Will, and woman of few words, is a neutral-oriented character who is well-rounded in a majority of areas that make her a nightmare to contest on the battlefield. Ramlethal's unique mechanic is her swords. These swords give her access to some of the best pokes in the game, high damage combo enders, and a strong projectile that pierces all others. Where this gets interesting is that when Ram sends that projectile, she loses access to the sword that was fired for either a set period of time, or until she runs up to where it landed and grabs it back. With how strong sword toss is, you'll want to use it, be it for offense, neutral, or counter zoning, but miss your shot and you'll lose access to all your best tools. Ram's neutral is her most standout characteristic. She has some of the largest normals in the game, and massive disjoints on all of these long-range pokes. In addition, if Ramlethal is anywhere near the corner, she can use her sword toss special move to get a fast and easy wall break for some serious damage and positive bonus. Given that Ramlethal's dash is so fast and her corner carry is high, Ram gets a lot of opportunities to cash out into big damage. Speaking of Ram's damage, she excels in a very unique way other characters don't. Her meterless damage is good, but where her real damage comes from is meter. Ram has not one, but two of the most powerful supers in the game, which together give her a way to seriously hurt every character in the game. Mortabato is a powerful super that deals big single hit damage, making it best used against characters with low guts. And Calvados deals more damage, but notably has a lot of hits. That means while it does do more damage, it builds the opponent's burst gauge much faster, so it's important to consider what you value the most at the moment. Calvados also guts crushes. If your damage is so scaled that your super is only doing 20% damage or so, Calvados is the way to go since damage can't go below 1, and Calvados consists of many low damage hits as opposed to one big one. All in all, Ram's meter usage is top-notch, and when your meter gain is as high as hers is, this ends up being more of a use-it-when-you-have-it type deal than something you have to, uh, actually think about. If Ram doesn't want to break the wall and instead leaves you in the corner, she's just as strong. Sword Toss doubles as a powerful pressure pool as it is plus on block. After the sword sticks into the wall, it explodes, which gives Ram even more plus frames that she can use to extend pressure by picking up the sword again, sneaking in a safe strike throw, getting a knockdown off 5D, or locking the opponent down as she repositions. If she's pushed out of range to pick up her sword again, she can use Flip Kick to fly in and grab it. If the opponent doesn't want to directly challenge Ram's offense, they'll have to spend meter on FD, and then try to escape either by air or ground. And while Ram usually threatens less damage here due to not having a sword, she can still restart her pressure from both ground and air hits due to her having one of the game's only air hard knockdowns. 
On defense, Ram isn't totally hopeless either. While she lacks a meterless reversal, and doesn't have the greatest mash-out tools around, her 6P is top class due to its extremely quick recovery, and Mortabato is possibly the strongest metered reversal in the game. And if she squeezes out with a jump, Ram can use Aerial Flip Kick to reposition safely. Rekka is an admittedly very risky mid-screen pressure tool. It's very minus, and always punishable if the opponent guesses right. Additionally, Instant Block can be used to throw her out of the follow-ups if you can get the timing right. She can special cancel from Rekka to make this harder, but that's a little bit committal. Additionally, Ram lacks any hard knockdowns that work consistently from mid-screen, as her 2D's range is severely lacking. If Ram is spaced a little further away and forces the opponent to block, she has more freedom when it comes to her offense. Ram's Ondo is a powerful plus-on-block projectile that lets her force the opponent to block again on Connect, cranking the risk gauge and ensuring that the next hit absolutely nukes the opponent. Ondo is extremely quick and is unable to be dashed away from after pokes such as 5H, meaning the opponent will have to commit to instant air dashes or rushing special moves to escape. But if they're wrong, it's a counter hit for Ram. And Ram likes counter hits. Ram has some truly oppressive attributes, such as some of the best buttons in the game, great damage off of them, great offense in the corner, and great corner carry to facilitate that, but can noticeably struggle in an up-close scrap. If you don't mind having a noticeable reliance on keeping to the mid-range to be powerful, but do like having a kit that in the right conditions feels completely unstoppable, Ram LaFall Valentine won't be your Valentine. She's still trying to figure out those kinds of emotions but she's at least willing to try. Leo is the game's third character that can be defined as a Shoto, and where Soul is about damage and Kai is about neutral, Leo sits on a balance of powerful mix-ups combined with excellent defense. You see, while the king may seem to be violent and aggressive on the outside, he secretly has a more gentle side. A side that's okay with blocking a few attacks. Then, of course, fiercely counterattacking with some of the best defensive options in the game. Leo's Flash Kick is a very powerful reversal, being immune to cross-ups and having great range for a move of this type. This is insanely strong, and it's not even the end of it. Leo also has a frame 5 throw-in vulnerable 2D that kills you on counter hit that he can use to hard call out anyone trying to throw his flash kick, and he gets great reward off of his mashes thanks to the ability to combo into back turn using the H version of Eisenstrom, which lacks frame 1 invuln, but grants him a knockdown suitable for a transition into stance. Leo's neutral isn't half bad either. Leo has a unique step dash as opposed to a run that lets him get far dash momentum off normals such as his 5k, and his 5h is a powerful long range tool that crushes 6ps. He has a strong fireball for counter poking that while usually minus, has multiple hits meaning it will blow through lower priority projectiles and continue traveling. His long range pokes have somewhat high recovery, but both his far slash and 5h has a unique stance transferable to after using them that auto guards all mids while allowing him to move slowly, and then pressing the opposite button will perform a powerful armored counterattack that's great for calling out opponents trying to whiff punish these normals. Leo's offense in and outside of back turn are very different, but generally you'd much rather be in back turn if your opponent is defending. Outside of it, Leo has the unique ability to reverse beat his slash normals, which gives him serviceable offense, but he can be prone to getting FD'd out of range while doing so, and has to commit to slow reset tools like 6H or Zwite to stop this. Zwite is his only real mix-up option outside of back turn that is at a normal thrower reset, but it adds enough mental stack to be important. Zwite is a plus on block cross-up that leaves Leo in back turn that can only be beaten by throwing it as Leo runs through you. While reactable on its own, once mixed in with Leo's other offensive options, it could be a true nightmare to defend against. If and when Leo is able to get into back turn, his offense evolves into something nightmarish. Leo gains access to fast lows, overheads, cross-ups, command throws, guard crushes, and every other special move he could use outside of stance to make for a truly challenging to block offense. One problem. When Leo is in back turn, he cannot block. 
This means Leo must carefully consider when to switch to back turn, as if the opponent escapes his pressure, it's easy to force him out by hitting him. However, the strength of back turn in the right situation is more than enough to warrant frequent use of the stance. It is his primary win condition, after all. All of these mix-ups can be made plus on block with a stance cancel as well, which allows him to safely transition into standard pressure if the opponent does block him out. While Leo does have to rely on strike throw without stance, his throw is maybe the strongest throw in the entire game thanks to it automatically transitioning Leo into his back turn, which we've already established is super important. Leo's primary weakness might be a surprise given his visual design and characterization, but his damage off of these mix-ups is actually quite low. Granted, it's very easy for Leo to hit you over and over again, but these conversions don't do a lot of damage unless he cashes out on meter and ends the combo without back turn OG, which sacrifices the chance of looping the mix-up situation anymore. Additionally, once Leo breaks the wall, he can't go back into stance without taking a risk. Overall, Leo is an extremely powerful all-rounder who should be near the top of any player's list if they want to play a character who excels in a multitude of situations, and is extremely tricky to put in a comfortable situation. Nagori Yuki is an absolute powerhouse of a character who is more than happy to decimate the opponent's life bar for a single mistake, and has the tools to do so off of even the most minuscule of mistakes. When Nagori Yuki's unique resource, the blood meter, is low, he plays practically in creative mode. Any hit can become a full corner carry 60% damage starter. He can whiff punish you from full screen, has the fastest dash in the game, a powerful plus on block projectile that destroys all other projectiles, 50-50 mix-ups off any block string, an extremely effective frame trap tool that kills you on hit, 10 million dollars straight to your bank account, a kiss on the forehead, and a story time before bed, you get the idea. However, all of these tie to his core mechanic, blood management. Using these special moves will raise Nagoriyuki's blood meter, which is sectioned off into three clear divisions. Each division up, a few things change about Nagoriyuki. One, his buttons get bigger and faster. This is entirely positive, making his pokes more powerful the higher he is on blood. Two, he begins to take more damage. This is negative for obvious reasons. Three, the meter is higher. You should already know this if you know addition, but the real thing you need to know is what happens when he maxes out his blood gauge. This is what that looks like. Playing Nagoriyuki is about always making sure you are committing the right amount of resources at the right times to avoid entering Blood Rage and losing the round. He has the strongest specials in the game by far, but use them too frequently and he will pay for his hubris. Nagoriyuki can only restore blood in two ways, waiting over time and landing sword rolls. The automatic restoration takes a long time and is unreliable in a real match, so you really want to try to force your opponent to deal with Nagoriyuki's sword normals which are any normal that involves his giant Odachi. Interestingly, his Close Slash, which uses one of his Daisho Swords, does not restore blood. The minigame of blood management allows for a very unique style select that isn't seen with many other characters. Nago can spend blood in many different ways, be it for powerful frame traps on offense, high damage neutral skips at the mid-range, or tricky movement to keep the opponent guessing, but he can only use so much before having to rely on his kit without use of special moves. This is Nagoriyuki's main struggle. The opponent can somewhat control Nago's blood flow through use of defensive mechanics like Burst or YRC, and if he is fighting a character such as Axel or Jacko that he really doesn't want to be at high blood against, this can be a serious problem. Just wait for him to use the blood, push him away, and win the round. Nago can play through this through use of his command grab, Blood Sucking Universe, which fully restores his blood gauge, meaning even characters who want to push him away have to commit with dealing with his offense due to the risk of the command grab negating their efforts towards forcing him to high blood. All of this is not to imply that Nago is bad at high blood. 
His buttons are massive and very hard to contest, with his 2S being one of the best mid-range pokes in the game, his 2H acting as a massive anti-air slash mid-range poke, and his 4 slash and 5H being powerful long-range checking tools. Additionally, Nagoroyuki has special Rekka follow-ups to his far slash, allowing him to restore extra blood on connect or apply offensive pressure through use of Fukio resets or frame traps. Nago also has exceptional defense despite the lack of any uniquely defining defensive tools thanks to his powerful conversions with blood, solid abare in 5p, 2p, 5k, and 2k, and high health. In conclusion, Nagoroyuki is a heavily adaptive character who can spend his blood resource to dominate in just about any scenario, but must be careful about when and where he chooses to do so. Fail to take this into account, and Nagoroyuki won't be the only one raging as you lose the round off of such a foolish mistake. Giovanna doesn't have the time to think about things like set play, neutral, and defense, and prefers to take a more direct route in her fighting style. Gio is a simple character who is built on a foundation of incredibly powerful fundamental strengths that make her a nightmare to challenge in the hands of a skilled player. The first thing you'll notice with Giovanna is her insane dash speed. With one dash, Gio can end up traveling three quarters of the screen letting herself incredibly well to whiff punishing, and thanks to her fast normals, she is almost certainly the best at doing so in the entire game. Her air dash is also exceptionally fast, and she has a strong plus on block anti-fireball tool in Travel, as well as a slow but extremely disjointed and high reward 2D. All of this means Giovanna's neutral is incredibly powerful in the hands of a player who knows how to force the opponent to whiff attacks and then use those openings to score their hits. She can struggle if you have trouble punishing these situations, as she lacks strong poking normals and her mobility can be somewhat linear at times, meaning if you approach without strategy, you are likely to be outranged and outpoked. On offense, Chiyo has a set of incredibly effective fundamental tools to keep you scared. Her close slash is very plus, her dash is incredibly fast, lending her will to hitting you with a quick dash throw, and her 2S is a multi-hitting low that will catch opponents trying to fuzzy tech or jump by standing up in the middle of a block strip. Geo also has strong counter hit damage with meter... ...and her meterless damage is quite impressive as well. Travao serves an important role here as a hard-to-check block string reset which is complemented by her Sepultra, a safe block string ender and powerful frame trap tool that adds a strong, and most importantly, riskless final step to her offense. She also has Sol Puente, a tricky to react to cross-up special that has low reward on hit, but thanks to RC, can threaten high damage with the use of meter. Speaking of meter, Giovanna gets an answer to her semi-linear mobility with 50 bar as her Tempestad Overdrive is a plus-on-block, high-damaging dive kick that can check anyone trying to anti-air a regular jump-in, allowing her to close the gap on characters who can stuff her approach as well and inflict some serious damage while doing so. Geo also has Sol Nascente, which is effectively a 6p on steroids. It doesn't get full invuln like an average DP, but it gets its upper body invuln faster than any other anti-air and nets insane reward on counter-hit. This can be used both as an anti-air and mid-crushing counter poke in neutral, Giovanna also has the ability to power up any of the aforementioned special moves with the use of Shavi, a command dash cancelable into every one of her specials. This upgrades them and lets her use more effective versions of her already powerful tools. While Gio has to deal with weaknesses such as short range and lack of mix-ups, this is a complete non-issue thanks to her overwhelming neutral strength due to her speed and her overwhelming offense presence due to her safe frame traps and resets. The final thing to note would be Giovanna's possession mechanic. The higher meter Giovanna is at, the higher defense she has, and she begins to deal chip damage on block, which only serves to make her a bigger threat. If you want to play a character with an extremely consistent game plan built on core principles that no bad matchup can take away from you, Giovanna may just be the character for you. Angie Mito. 
Anji Mito is a fluid fighter who uses his wits and guile to outsmart the opponents through use of high risk, high reward reads, then uses his mm, other assets to pummel your life bar and seriously make you regret getting outsmarted. Anji's kit is filled to the brim with tools that grant him very high reward when used successfully, but a very consistent theme is that all of these tools put Anji at immense risk himself. In neutral, Anji has quick and serviceable pokes in Far Slash and 2S, as well as some longer pokes in 5H and Fujin, but all of these pokes have substantial whip recovery. Anji's main neutral tool is Spin, which is a 10-frame counter that auto-guards through all attacks during its active frames, low, mid, or high. On a successful parry, Anji is put into a little bit of recovery while the opponent is left to whip their attack, allowing Anji to get a close-range punish depending on the recovery the opponent has left in their attack. This parry can net incredibly strong reward on a high recovery attack like a Far Slash or 5H, but it can be weak against smaller buttons or projectile attacks, as if the opponent isn't locked into any recovery, they actually end up being plus after Anji recovers. Anji's answer? Put the fish on it. After any guard point, Anji can cancel it to the fish, which is an incredibly quick, plus on block, guard crush, fully invulnerable DP that hard knockdowns on hit. Yeah. If May didn't convince you that Sea Life is the most powerful life in Guilty Gear, surely you're convinced now. So what's stopping the opponent from simply waiting out every spin they see? Anji can actually spin before a number of different special moves by holding the attack button after the motion. Holding quarter circle forward and kick does a prolonged spin, quarter circle forward and slash spins into Ko, a high damage anti-air attack, and quarter circle forward into heavy slash spins into Fujin, a high damage frame trap slash wreck combo move with powerful follow ups each of these moves can also be used individually without the spin, but when held for their full duration, gain more powerful properties like higher damage, better combos on connect, and higher block stun. Fujin is a very powerful and polarizing tool that defines Anji as a character almost as much as spin does. This move frame traps from almost any of Anji's buttons, has great forward momentum, and follow-ups that can be performed to mix up the opponent on block. After pressing Fujin, press any of the four main buttons for a follow-up. P is a fan toss that can be jumped but grants Anji plus frames which can be used to continue his offense. K is a hop that is best used to reposition after missing a Fujin but can be combined with meter for use of a varial timing high low throw mix up. S is a low that frame traps anyone mashing or trying to jump a different follow up, and H is an overhead to catch people trying to block the low. Fujin is RPS, meaning the opponent has just as good a chance to escape it as you do of hitting them but Anji's high health and damage keep the odds in his favor in situations like these. Additionally, Anji has a good choice of high damage frame traps in his normal block strings that make it extremely hard for the opponent to find an escape, such as 2S, 5H, 6H, and the aforementioned Fuji. Anji also has the tools to survive on defense despite lacking a traditional reversal of any kind. His 2P is among the strongest in the game, giving him an incredibly high range mash option that combos on counter hit, allowing him to shift momentum very easily, and with 50 tension, he gains access to Kancho Fugetsu, a counter super that parries the opponent's strike and deals large damage. After a knockdown, Anji can set up simple set play with Shitsu, letting him build risk safely and start a block string with a little more on the line for the opponent, or try to sneak in a completely fake, but occasionally challenging to spot mix up. If tricking your opponent into making mistakes and dancing through their every attack before delivering devastating counterattacks sounds your style, you may want to take the stage with Anji Mito. Eno, the hard rock witch, is here to serenade you with her sweet electric guitar, then dominate you with her powerful looping mix-ups. The first thing you'll notice with Eno is that her movement is radically different from other characters. Instead of a ground dash, she has a hover dash, which puts her into the air slightly, and instead of an air dash, she slowly glides downwards. This hover dash allows her to use her air attacks lower to the ground than any character in the game. This is Eno's core principle upon which her entire game plan is based off of. Starting with neutral, the hover dash will go over some mids and all lows, meaning the opponent is restricted in what attacks they can use to check the 
approach. Additionally, she has strong low profile in 2S and stroke the big tree, making it feel very threatening for the opponent to attack into her. If they are poking with safe mids, she has strong counter pokes in 2H and 5H. A long range check on Zoners with chemical love, a controllable fireball that can chase the opponent down and force them to block, and a set of dive kicks that she can use to further mix up her mobility. Eno can struggle with powerful disjoints that cover both air and ground approaches, such as Solar Maze 2S, as her short range makes it difficult to counter poke, but she can use standard whiff punish to deal with these tricky attacks. On offense, Eno's Hover Dash becomes even scarier. Due to her ability to throw out aerial attacks quick and low to the ground, Eno can launch high-low mix-ups like nobody's business. Will she land and do a low, or hover and do an overhead? It's almost impossible to know. And if you are defending against the flight on time, Eno has stalling options such as her JD or a simple empty jump low to throw off fuzzy timings and make even the most practiced opponents drop their guard. With 50 tension, Eno gains access to a plus on block guard crush to safely reset a block string, and a high damage command grab that makes her mix-up game all the more scary. If Eno is blocked to a range where her mix-ups are too far to reach, she can force the opponent to respect a couple final options before being truly finished. S Stroke the Big Tree can be used to frame trap an opponent trying to escape after blocking Eno, and Chemical Love can catch backdashes and jump attempts as well. Threatening Delayed cancels into these lets her steal back her turn by simply restarting block strings with another hover, which can be tricky to defend against if layered properly. Additionally, Eno can go all in on Mad Love Agitato, a powerful guard crush that resets any block string with plus frames and looks identical to her hover dash, but is mashable, making it a risky yet extremely rewarding option to keep her offense rocking. Eno's defense is relatively standard, but she has strong escape options if the opponent leaves a gap in their offense. Stroke the Big Tree gains its low profile very quickly, meaning it can duck under mids and highs to escape pressure, and Eno can also use her dive kicks to fly out of the corner if she gets a jump opportunity. Eno may be the very culmination of a rushdown character, despite her unorthodox movement. She has short range, but the tools to check defensive play, and takes pleasure in crushing you into a pulp with her looping high-low mix-ups. If you take pleasure in inflicting painful mix-ups on your opponent, and don't mind occasionally being restricted in terms of neutral options, Eno is more than happy to make you her faithful servant. Gold Lewis is a lot of things. He's the Secretary of Defense for the United States of America. He's an alien denier, despite owning an alien himself. He's a cryptid believer, and most importantly, he's a big, big man, and he does big, big damage. Gold Lewis is a character hyper-focused on offense. His damage numbers are insane. He deals heavy damage to you even on the block, He brings an arsenal of tools to steal the neutral and skip right to his offense. And even if his mobility may be lacking, he is a big guy after all, he is more than gutsy enough to make up for it. Gold Lewis's defining special move is Behemoth Typhoon. A half circle in any direction, anyone at all, will command Gold Lewis to swing his heavy coffin in the direction you input, which launches a high damaging, guard crushing, soul destroying slam that will be sure to beat your opponent into submission. Each BT has different properties and different uses, so let's quickly go through them all. 426 is a powerful forward blow that can bounce opponents off walls and grants plus frames. 624 is a frame traffic slam that is minus on block but has no escape point if used in a block strike. 268 is very similar but plus and with shorter range and occasionally a small gap. 862 is a short range plus on block overhead. 486 is a slow, long range plus on block overhead. 684 is used to convert from pokes into hard knockdown to start Gold Lewis's offense. 842 is a low that is plus on block, and 248 is a short range low that will side switch the opponent. Switching up your BTs to create plus frames, deal chip damage, and frame trap the opponent is the core of Gold Lewis's offense, and mixed together with his normal attacks such as Far Slash and 5k that will keep the opponent in check, 
Golduis may very well be the scariest opponent to block in the game. Golduis's neutral is simple yet effective. He has a low crush in 5k, a long range plus on block 2p for checking dashes and non-disjointed pokes, a good range far slash, and some high profile options thanks to his incredibly short jump height such as JD. Gold Lewis also has access to a no-nonsense, turn-stealing, damage-dealing, coffin-feeling Wild Assault that lets him mosey on by any attack and start swinging. Gold Lewis's mobility is his true weakness. His dash is very slow, his jump startup is slowest in the game, he can't double jump, his air dash is slow, and his jump is very low to the ground. The only real benefit here is that his low jump lets him use air attacks low to the ground to make his offense and neutral scarier. But otherwise, this can be a serious trouble for Gold Lewis, especially on defense. Gold Lewis's official title is the Secretary of Absolute Defense, but uh, he might as well be called the Secretary of Absolutely No Defense, as his defensive options are quite poor, with jumping out of pressure as almost a complete non-option, and a decent but not character-defining 5 frame, a slow dash and slow normals, Gold Lewis has one of the worst disadvantage states in the game, made better only by his high health. You might have noticed Gold Lewis' secondary meter, but it might be better to think of this as more of a cooldown than something you have to manage. This is Gold Lewis' security gauge, and it effectively puts a timer on some of his most powerful neutral skipping tools. At high level security, two of his special moves get powered up, Skyfish and Thunderbird. Skyfish is a long range minigun shot that at higher security levels has more shots and knocks the opponent down which is good for anti-zoning and stopping setup characters. Thunderbird is an abomination. This move is insane. Remember Potemkin's gigantic high super? This is that, but on a cooldown instead of costing meter. If Gold Lewis just follows the drone across the screen, he is almost guaranteed to win neutral barring specific character interactions and extremely risky pokes into the drone to hit Gold Lewis and destroy him. Options like these allow Gold Lewis to consistently take his turn on offense despite his low mobility and if he can get in just once or twice, he has everything he needs to win the round from that alone. If you wish to show your opponent some good old southern hospitality, and don't mind not being as quick as you used to be in the good old days, settle down with Gold Lewis Dickinson, the secretary of an absolutely crushing offense. Like popcorn, can you hear the bells ding dong? This is it, this is it. Jacko. Jacko Valentine is the sweets loving girlfriend of Soul Bad Guy, but she's just as much of a nightmare on the battlefield as he is. Jacko fights by controlling her servants, small winged creatures that she can place, move around the screen, and command through use of her toolkit of very simple yet incredibly adaptable moves. Let's first focus on the corner sword of her toolkit, her minions. Minions are tied to the minion gauge. Jacko needs to spend one bar of her gauge to summon a minion, which sounds simple as there's three chunks, but it's a little more complicated under the hood. You see, there are two colors of the minion gauge, yellow and gray. You need yellow gauge to summon a minion, and gray gauge could be used to command a minion. However, Yellow Gauge holds priority over Gray Gauge, meaning that if you have a full bar of Yellow Gauge, you can still command a minion, but it will take one chunk of both Yellow and the Gray Gauge underneath it, whereas summoning a minion will leave the Gray Gauge beneath the Yellow after doing so. Jacko tends to need to be able to gain space to set up her minions, as doing so in a block string or in neutral is disadvantageous, and after doing so she needs to take even more time to get said minion into a good spot before carrying it or launching it. Luckily, Jacko has extremely potent close-range pokes such as her 2k, which is 6 frames, combos into hard knockdown consistently, has low profile, and is exceptionally hard to whiff punish. Jacko also has good tools to call out backdashes or people out spacing outside of her 2k, thanks to her momentum shifting normals such as 2d and 5h. If Jacko wants to retreat, she can send an air fireball using her JD that has an incredible angle and usually lets Jacko gain enough plus frames to start a block string or set up a minion. Holding down the punch button after summoning a minion lets her hold on to the minion reposition before dropping it with Dusk or throwing it. Doing the motion normally lets her set it down. After getting the minion in position, Jacko has to hit it with her normals to send it soaring through the air and hopefully at the opponent. Each of her different normals has a different trajectory she can send the minion on, such as a fast forward kick that destroys projectiles, an arcing bounce that covers the ground below her, an anti-air cannon that sends the minion into the stratosphere, and other angles that can be used to make her neutral very tricky. When Jacko gets a minion where she wants it, she has a few things she can do with it. Well, two. You don't want to recall them because they get recalled, and you don't want to use this one. Just trust me, it's bad. 
maybe worst move in the game bad. Don't use it. Anyways, Jacko has two things she can do to a minion once it's out. Attack and defend. Attack command is a quick lollipop strike performed by the minion in the direction of the opponent that will launch for a combo on hit and leaves Jacko at a staggering plus 15 on block. This command is the cornerstone of Jacko's offensive capabilities. Being able to use minions to acquire plus frames on command lets Jacko set up for strike throw mix-ups, overheads, and more advanced setups that would usually take too much time to work. Jacko can also use the bounce of the servants to acquire these plus frames without having to spend meter upon doing so, making her pressure extremely adaptable depending on the status of your minion gauge. All of this makes her offense extremely potent, but Jacko also builds meter quickly and can use it on the cheer servant on H, an incredibly powerful super that lets Jacko perform a true block string to crank the opponent's risk and go for a mix-up if she has a minion out. All in all, with minions, Jacko's offense is very powerful, but without them, she struggles to take her turn. Usually Jacko needs a hit to set a minion, and with an incredibly simple set of frame traps that all end extremely minus on block, Jacko will usually need to try to get away with setting a minion in a block string or pulling one and running away in order to take her turn when making the opponent block. Her other command has a more defensive use. Defend command puts up a shield for a short duration that will parry incoming attacks and do a little bit of chip damage to boot. This is good for stopping an opponent trying to clear out the minions on the screen or deflect projectiles coming at Jacko and her minions. It is of utmost importance to use these tools properly in neutral, as if an attack connects with Jacko, block or hit, all minions despawn, meaning she really needs to stay on top of making sure the screen is too threatening for the opponent to swing in, or she can come toppling down like a house of cards. If you don't mind running into a couple challenging matchups every now and then, Jacko's toolkit is incredibly rewarding to learn, as her minions make her incredibly comfortable playing anywhere on the screen, giving her a flowing gameplay that is unlike any other character in the game. If this sounds appealing to you, swear your allegiance to the minion army, and they will serve you for eternity. There's no way you'll believe me when I say this, but I'm really hoping you guys win. Because I'd like to see you again. Something I forgot about it in two seconds. That's my way. Happy Chaos, the gunslinging broken messiah is a resource character who has to manage two resources, his bullets and his concentration, in exchange for one of the absolute most powerful tools in all of fighting games. Chaos's core mechanic is his gun. Happy Chaos entirely lacks the heavy slash button, and upon pressing it, he will pull out his pistol. This spawns a reticle on the screen that will slowly try to track the opponent as they move across the screen. Pressing the H button again while this is happening shoots them which spawns an instantaneous hitbox that will damage them through anything in the game, including walls that normally stop projectiles or even normal hitboxes. Keeping the gun out costs concentration, and every shot spends a chunk of concentration as well as a bullet, of which he can store six. Because of this, keeping on top of resource management is key for Happy Chaos. Luckily, he has the tools and then some to keep his economy high. His steady aim special move focuses in his gunshot and lets him charge up an undodgeable shot with immense plus frames, allowing him to reload after each shot and keep his bullets up while walking the opponent in place. Or he can use these plus frames to run in and take his turn. Happy Chaos can also use Curse, a very powerful projectile that, again, can't be deflected, to make his reticle focus stronger. And yes, this includes during steady aim. If Happy Chaos runs low on concentration, he'll need to use his Focus Special, which will recover some concentration and reduce the amount he spends per shot for a short duration. He usually needs a full targeted steady shot or a hit to do this, outside of spending another resource like Clone, which steals his HP to put a single hit wall in front of the opponent that is extremely risky to try to attack. All of this might paint the picture to you that Happy Chaos is a zoner who wants to shoot from afar, and while he can zone, especially to close out a round with a chip damage kill, his resources are so insanely powerful on offense, it's a waste to use them just to keep playing keep away. Happy Chaos's reticle always targets when the opponent is in block or hit stun, making it an on-demand plus frame button with absolutely zero startup active for recovery for Chaos. This means each bullet can be used for a completely safe and even plus on block mix-up, keep a block string going and force the opponent to respect stuff that would otherwise be fake. 
Happy Chaos's dust attack is very short range, but thanks to Gunshot, it's one of the scariest dusts in the game due to his ability to get a full combo off of it. And his roll special move is a 16, you heard me right, 16 frame cross up that combos into a hard knockdown for him to get his bullets back on hit, is safe on block, and can only be countered by committing to a throw in the middle of Happy Chaos's offense. Chaos probably has the best conversions in the game. Again, thanks to the gun, he can fire a shot after landing something small like a 2P, and then pick up into a combo reminiscent of a different character's counter hit combo. Chaos can easily corner to corner you of a single light hit provided he has the resources, and his smaller combos can go resource neutral as well, making him absolutely terrifying to get hit by, made even worse by his positive bonus state being extremely threatening thanks to it letting him RC to gain more resources on block more often than continue pressure. Both of Chaos's supers also allow him to fix management mistakes, as his Deus Ex Machina super reloads all his bullets, and his super focus not only leaves him plus on activation when cancelled from a normal, but fills up his focus bar and buffs his focus spending as well. So far, Chaos is a menace on offense, and has the ability to turn any hit or block into a huge opportunity, so naturally his pokes should be on the weaker side, right? <laughs> nope. Happy Chaos has some of the best normals in the game, sporting a best-in-class 2K with very fast, long, and low, low profile. A powerful and hard to whiff punish 2S, a strong tool to catch backdash such as success, and a strong and reliable neutral check in far slash. All of these pokes are strong on their own, but combined with each other, the ability to convert every single one of them into a wall break or knockdown anywhere on the screen, powerful disengagement tools like Curse, and a quick reaction check for plus frames by using steady aim, Happy Chaos truly has some of the most fearsome neutral in the game. On defenses where Chaos is the most threatened, Happy Chaos lacks an invincible reversal entirely, and while his YRC affords him some of the strongest momentum shifting, thanks to it allowing him to get his full offensive potential without any setup, the opponent could look out for YRC and either bait it or burst Happy Chaos once he takes out the gun to start his pressure, as he cannot block while holding the gun out. Happy Chaos is truly a character like no other. While he can be challenging to play and punishing to make mistakes as, he excels at almost everything he does, and his bullet mechanic allows him to have immensely powerful, creative, and adaptive gameplay that can't be rivaled by any other character. If you don't mind having to focus up every now and then in order to play optimally, and love riddling your opponent with bullet after bullet, take a ride with Happy Chaos. <laughs> I've wandered around for 20 years. What's one more trip? You're the only person who could ever talk me out of my revenge. By this time, you know my answer. <laughs> Baikin is an unfaltering samurai warrior driven by anger and revenge, and her playstyle certainly suits these character traits. Baikin is a character defined by simple yet incredibly effective options like easy looping mix-ups, a matchup defining parry, great mid-range normals, and high damaging options from her larger hits. Baikin's round start is immensely powerful thanks to her far slash, which is likely the best round start in the game due to its 9 frame startup, it reaching from round start, being incredibly challenging to whiff punish, and allowing her to combo on counter hit into the start of her looping mix up game. When Baikin lands a hit such as this, she's afforded the ability to start with a simple high low by IADing and pressing an air normal into either her air stalling special move Yui Zansen, or simply landing and doing a low. After this, she can apply even more threatening offense through use of high damage gallons with multiple frame trap opportunities thanks to attacks like her 6k, Tatami Geish, and H Kabari. Baikin also has a very powerful reset in S Kabari, which pulls the opponent closer to her, leaves her at plus 2 on block, and most importantly, tethers the opponent. Baikin's tether mechanic is a cornerstone of her offense and makes it so opponents can't escape arms reach of Baikin letting her extend block strings for longer, perform combos that would otherwise be impossible, 
and on knockdown perform looping 4-way mix that is completely safe on block and comparable on hit. Biken's offense extends even further when you consider how effective her strike throw is due to her throw tethering the opponent on connect and immediately allowing her to start her looping mix. And if that wasn't strong enough, Biken also has instant overhead low 50-50s off any jump cancelable normal thanks to TK Yozansa, an instantaneous overhead that, while punishable on block, forces the opponent to guess as there is absolutely no window to react at all. And if Biken has 50 meter, she's plus after the mix-up is blocked and gets a full combo on hit. Biken can absolutely maul you on offense, but returning to neutral certainly isn't the end of the world for her. While it's true that Biken has short-range pokes and very low mobility, she also has some of the best air normals in the game thanks to her JS being incredibly quick and large, JH crushing 6Ps, and all of these being safe on block from any height thanks to the ability to cancel into Yozansen to keep herself from being throw punished, and usually plus on block to boot. Biken's close-range pokes such as her jab, far slash, and 2S are all incredible normals with the caveat that without meter or a counter hit, she's unlikely to get a combo from them. Biken has slower but serviceable tools to use from a range in neutrals such as the incredibly disjointed Mitch Kabari, which on block can let Biken force a guess between a frame trapping follow-up or simply stealing her turn and starting offense. Biken also has a powerful low profile 2H that is great at catching backdashes and low profiling certain mid attacks. However, both of these tools have exceptionally high whiff recovery, so it's important not to use them too often. That being said, if you do use them too often and get punished, Biken has some of the best defensive options in the entire game. Biken has a fully comboable 4 frame that lets her get soft knockdowns on normal hit, noticeably higher health than all other lightweight characters, a versatile reversal super, and the character defining parry, Hiragi. Hiragi is a counter with frame 1 activation and 7 frames of parry window that deals massive damage on Kinect as well as gives Biken Oki letting her start her incredibly close offense, on top of dealing a huge chunk of damage to the enemy's life bar. This is a parry and not a DP, meaning it beats safe jumps, which makes it even more powerful, but will lose to projectiles and won't get the full connect if a long enough disjoint hits it. Biken struggles with defensive play more than the average character due to her dash speed being second slowest in the game, Gold Lewis being the only character slower, and her pokes being noticeably short range compared to other normals. But her offensive and defensive traits are so powerful that Biken doesn't even need to be able to win neutral most games in order to start her offense thanks to her uncanny ability to win just from blocking. If you want to put fear into your opponent's heart on both your offense and their offense, enjoy frustrating them with high damage options and looping mix-ups, and don't mind having to play a slower paced neutral, embody your anger and slash through the competition with Biken. The elegant Grim Reaper Testament joins Guilty Gear Strive's roster as the final character in Season Pass 1, and brings with them a powerful assortment of dominating neutral tools that can be used to keep the opponent slamming their head into a brick wall of projectiles, normals, safe mix-ups, and more. Testament's neutral is defined by access to a lot of screen states thanks to how their projectiles work. Usually Testament needs to follow a semi-rhythmic pattern in order to start the flow of their neutral after escaping round start. Round start itself isn't an issue thanks to strong tools such as 2k, far slash, 2s, and 5k, and after gaining some space or making the opponent block, Testament can use their Grave Reaper special move to put a strong projectile on the screen. This projectile can be charged to make it last longer on the screen as well as be angled upwards to catch anyone trying to jump in at Testament, and it has quite low recovery for a projectile, being 100% unpunishable if blocked from a close range. This fireball also has a swinging attack before it that destroys other projectiles, lending Testament well to counter zone. It can also be used in the air and is more advantageous when used this way, encouraging Testament to mix up fireball options while zoning. After Grave Reaper spawns and disappears, one of Testament's succubi will spawn and linger where it left. This succubus can be used in two ways. Normally, Testament will want to send Unholy Diver, which will automatically target the succubus and send Testament's crow familiar to its location. 
This is a single hit, advantageous on block projectile that puts the opponent into the stain state on hitter block, which is Testament's big win condition. When the opponent is stained, they will stay that way until a certain amount of time has passed or Testament gets hit. And if Testament hits the opponent with any move other than their projectiles, the stain will activate a powerful hitbox that makes whatever was just used plus on block and cobble ball on hit. This turns Testament's already daunting neutral into a minefield where any single hit can lead to a full combo and knockdown no matter what button was used to get there. And while activating Stain on block isn't as powerful, Testament has simple yet safe and effective pressure to make it a situation worth avoiding. On offense, Testament has a few tricks up their sleeve they can use to keep the opponent guessing. H Grave Reaper is plus on block, and so is a charged S Grave Reaper, and both of these options can be easily stringed into from Testament's 2H, a vacuuming low with high block stun. This could loop for as long as you choose to remain passive, as Testament can then use Grave Reaper to call on Holy Diver, activate the stain, set the projectile back up, and start again. In order for the opponent to escape, they must either FD Testament out and escape by ground or air, or directly challenge gaps in this pressure with 6P. This is Testament's main difficulty on offense, as to reloop this offense, they need to press buttons that could be 6P'd, or leave considerably large mashable gaps. But this is simply RPS that the opponent, and by extension Testament themselves, needs to respect. Testament's offense is a bit stronger after a knockdown, as they can start with an IAD mix-up that forces the opponent to guess high or low, and is comboable on hit and safe on block. When forcing block strings from a mid to long range, Testament can use Arbiter Sign to check dashes as well as mix up a stationary opponent thanks to the ability to call either a low or overhead version of this move. But this cannot be used in up-close offense frequently due to the fact that it has both a minimum and maximum range that it must be used inside to hit the opponent. Back to neutral, when they're on the back foot, Testament has a number of strong tools they can use to shift the tides. The second thing they can do with the Succubi on screen is a quick teleport to its location that can get Testament out of a sticky situation, and can also be fainted to confuse the opponent. Testament also has one of the strongest 6 moves in the game to counter an opponent who gets too aggressive in the air, and Testament themselves has some incredibly powerful air options thanks to the ability to use a majority of their specials in the air, as well as having a powerful JH that beats 6 moves similar to Viking's JH, and a JK with a strong cross-up hitbox best used for IADing over somebody's head and safely escaping out of the corner or similarly scary screen space. Testament's defense is nothing to write home about. They have a standard 5 frame, no meterless reversal, and a slow metered reversal that pretty much requires the use of the super PRC tech to be effective thanks to its ability to be safe jumped by almost every character in the roster. Their only other weakness is a lower than average mobility and no movement oriented special moves to speak of, but their dominant neutral moves is more than enough to make this hardly noticeable. If you don't mind having to rely on playing neutral for 99% of the game, but really enjoy making the opponent frustrated while losing said neutral over and over again, the new and testament might get along quite well. Mankind knew that they cannot change society, so instead of reflecting on themselves, they blame the Bridget is a mischievous fighter who sports one of, if not the most well-rounded kit in the game, with incredibly strong neutral, mobility, offense, defense, mix-ups, combos, tricks, and more. Round start is no problem at all for Bridget, with pokes like 2S to catch normal round starts, and strong counter pokes like 2P to keep the opponent from trying to either whiff punish 2S or approach and use a closer range normal of their own. When Bridget makes the opponent block or escapes round start, she can set up her yo-yo projectile, which is the most important tool in Bridget's arsenal. This yo-yo can be set in two ways, with a quarter circle forward or back, and this changes the property of the projectile. Doing a quarter circle forward has the yo-yo travel with a hitbox on its way to the opponent, making it minus three at worst, and usually quite plus, after which it will stay on the screen for a couple seconds then return to Bridget. Bridget can also set it without a hitbox, which is obviously minus due to there not actually being a part that can hit the opponent, but on its way back will have a hitbox, letting Bridget easily jail into a powerful mix-up and score hits in neutral easily. The yo-yo can also be angled up or forward, and used in the air or on the ground, making this an incredibly powerful and versatile projectile. Once the yo-yo is out, Bridget's threat level increases tenfold as she unlocks her rolling movement special, one of the strongest mobility tools in the game. This sends Bridget flying towards the yo-yo's position with an active hitbox, and can be altered in many ways to make it near impossible to catch her flying around the screen. The roll could be delayed, cancelled to the jumps and dashes, cancelled to the normals, specials, 
and simply dropped to allow for Bridget to land safely, all without restricting Bridget into any long recovery other than the actual rolling part of the special move. This makes Bridget a nightmare to fight with the yo-yo out, but connecting an attack with her is the only way to remove the yo-yo from the screen, and playing passive is just asking for her to set up the hit on return yo-yo and starting her offense for free. Speaking of Bridget's offense, it's incredibly powerful thanks to rolling movement affording her, in most cases, completely safe high-low 50-50s through use of air delays and strong combo lows. Bridget can also reset by sneaking hit on return yo-yo in block strikes. Frame trap with numerous tools such as standard yo-yo, kickstart my heart, delayed gatlings, and rolling movement fades. Bridget also has a command grab that lets her set up the yo-yo for more mix-ups on connect, and can spend meter on more true 50-50s from Kickstart My Heart if the opponent blocks out a full string for one final hurrah. Bridget also ends block strings extremely safely thanks to her being able to push the opponent to a range with her long-range normals, then throw the yo-yo to end the block string and immediately force the opponent to come at her before starting the infuriating air movement from roll again. Or Bridget can steal her turn by steering Kickstart My Heart to end right as it connects with the opponent, leaving her plus. Speaking of neutral, Bridget excels here too. With great range pokes that are all confirmable into knockdowns like 2S and 5H, it can be incredibly hard to get in on this yo-yo wielding assassin. Bridget also has even more incredible pokes in the air like JH and JS, and some great anti-airs in 6P and 2H that make stopping Bridget from just doing whatever she wants a nightmare. So with all that being said, what is Bridget's big weakness? Well, her damage output can be considerably lower than a lot of other characters in the game, but outside of that, she's got no major flaws. Perks of being so flexible is you're never playing around any vulnerabilities. Bridget just goes with the flow. Uniquely, Bridget does not have a single throw in vulnerable reversal, which can be an issue since neither of her supers have invul, but she's covered on defense with Starship, her meterless reversal, and her supers are both incredibly strong in other ways to make up for it. Ultimately, Bridget is the character for players who like to play all-rounders, but don't like to feel mediocre at everything. She's a jack of all trades for sure but certainly not a master of none. Sinkisk may look like a powerful beefcake of a man who's got it all figured out, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. The kid's half gear and aged really fast. He's actually only five years old. Living with his Grampy, none other than Soul Bad Guy, has really shifted the kid's development in a strange way. Sin is an expert fighter using techniques from both his father Kai and his guardian Soul to fight on the battlefield with a smile that you couldn't help but love right before he turns your smile to a frown. Sin's a bit of a prodigy, excelling at both his father's and grandfather's techniques, but right from the start, he unfortunately hits a small bump. Sin's round start is typically quite weak. His pokes either won't reach or will be slower than other characters' round starts, meaning he'll often have to simply walk back and whiff punish or challenge directly with high committal tools such as his sweep. However, much like Sin's balance history, things drastically improve from here. While he may not interact directly at round start well, landing with punishes can be incredibly rewarding for the boy thanks to his stamina mechanic. All his special moves have follow-ups at the cost of one stamina, of which he stores three, that he can use for more powerful advantage on hit or block to transform his toolkit from low reward to terrifyingly deadly. When operating in neutral, Sin has potent long-range pokes such as Far Slash or 2S, with the former being a faster, longer-range poke and the latter being slightly slower but near impossible to whiff punish and also beating 6 Ps. On connect, Sin can follow up into Beak Driver and its follow-up to score a knockdown, and if he wants pressure, he can spend another stamina to use Gazelle Step, a command dash follow-up that starts his turn with one stamina remaining. In situations where Sin's buttons won't do the trick, he has one of the strongest neutral skips in the game with Elk Hunt. Elk Hunt is Sin's take on Stun Dipper, and while slower than Kai's version at 21 frames, goes just as far, and most importantly, Sin can spend stamina to make this move plus on bluff, which is something Kai could only dream of doing. Being able to spend stamina to skip straight to Sin's offense is incredibly good due to him frankly being very intelligent and taking a few pages from Soul's book when it's his turn. Sin's damage output is ridiculous. While his frame traps are fairly standard, Sin has access to pressure resets such as the aforementioned plus on block Elk Hunt, which must be thrown, his plus on block 6k, 
and simple stagger resets that are made even more deadly due to Sin's high damage. Sin tends to run a strike throw oriented offense, but he can apply effective mental stack using his hoof stomp, an overhead that may not be the fastest in the world, but is extremely threatening due to it beating low attacks and throws, as well as synergizing well with Sin's other offensive tools. On offense, Sin is generally blessed with safe block string enders such as 5H, 6H, and Beak Driver follow up, all of which are unpunishable on block, but solid instant blocks from the opponent can get these attacks throw punished if Sin lacks further stamina to make himself safer. This is one of Sin's limiting factors. When low on stamina, he becomes significantly less threatening, losing combos on many hits and a lot of attacks being minus and even punishable on hit as well. However, his overwhelming power with stamina is enough to tip the scales in Sin's favor. One of Sin's most outstanding traits is defense. Sin's Hawk Baker is the single most powerful reversal in the game, knitting Sin Oki on hit, being slightly hard to whiff punish on block, and having devastating effects when combined with Sin's supers. Sin's second most outstanding trait would have to be these supers. Both of Sin's supers are top notch, with Tyrant Barrel standing as the single highest damaging super in the game, and Ride the Lightning sporting extreme corner carry to help Sin break the wall from any hit. As if this wasn't enough. If Sin has one stamina, he can Kara cancel into these supers from special moves, not even spending the stamina in the process, letting him wall break off of things like mid screen DP into Ride the Lightning and nuke your life bar after a simple blocking error with Hoof Stomp into Tyrant Barrel. Sin's a growing boy, and as all children are, he's a little impatient. In matchup where his pokes aren't very effective and Elk Hunt can be checked easily, he can find it a little hard to make his way in on the opponent, and may be lacking the stamina to win the round once he does slide in. But with his high damage, ability to win off defense, and solid pressure, these issues are few and far between. If a moveset featuring the best hits of the game's two most prolific Shotos and then some sounds your style, Sin's here to play, and he really hopes you'll be his friend forever. <laughs> Bedman is the trapped soul of a dead man, sworn to protect his sister Delilah through the vessel of his mechanical bed. Bedman acts animalistically, ruthlessly throwing out powerful attacks to defend the girl and push through each and every fight, resulting in his core mechanic error state. After all of Bedman's special moves, a timer begins, at the end of which, Bedman will perform an automatic follow-up to said special move with no startup, active, or recovery frames. This can let Bedman safely win neutral, extend pressure, and route unique combos due to the properties of each special move's error follow-up. Bedman can use tools like 2S, 2K, and Far Slash to help with round start, and upon escaping, he usually likes to start zoning patterns to help get errors quickly. After gaining some distance, Bedman can fire off Needle, a quick projectile that tracks the opponent's position on startup and fires towards them. After this, Bedman gains error charge for Lightning Bolt, which tracks the opponent further and allows Bedman to take their turn provided they get enough space to activate the error automatically. This Lightning Bolt is usually used with P-Call, which summons the error instantly at the cost of actually having startup and recovery, but this is less than what it would be if Bedman just did another Needle. Bedman also has a long-range low check in 2H, and some admittedly mediocre but serviceable pokes in 2S and Far Slash, where Bedman's neutral really shines in the air. Bedman has a unique 8-way air dash that can be stalled for a certain duration similar to Bridget's rolling movement. After moving from the air dash, Bedman can act quickly to out of the air dash with a falling button or special move. His JS is a great air-to-air. -air. JH is a strong jump-in that multi-hits, making it hard to block correctly when combined with landing into a low, especially with Bedman's JD, which can be Gatlinged into for an additional overhead. JD also serves utility as a second air stall after the 8-way air dash, making it even trickier to catch Bedman's air mobility. After scoring a hit, Bedman can combo into spinning top and get very powerful air stored. If Bedman can last long enough without blocking or getting hit, this error will summon a wall of fire that covers a large area of the screen and lets Bedman start pressure for free, and is significantly plus even when cancelled into using Call. Bedman's pressure relies on using these errors to keep the opponent blocking, then either mixing them up with universal overheads, jumping high lows, or a strike throw. Bedman's final special move is a big fiery punch that is incredibly strong due to always being plus on block and inflicting guard crush. 
This move frame traps for high damage after most normals and can be charged to inflict more damage and blocks don't on connect. This allows Batman to more than safely end block strings, add additional chip damage to currently in progress block strings, frame trap opponents, and store a strong error. A head explosion that similarly guard crushes the opponent, but deals great damage on hit and is very comboable as well. When called, this special move can usually be mashed out of, but due to Bedman's tricky frame traps and confusing visuals, it can be difficult to spot this escape window, making Bedman's pressure overwhelming when performed correctly. A very unique characteristic of Bedman's offense is these confusing visuals. Bedman's arrows have big visual effects that clutter the screen, and Delilah runs around in the foreground instead of the background, allowing Bedman to sneak in otherwise fake options behind the smoke and mirrors. Of note is 6H, an incredibly slow but rewarding overhead that can be hitted quite well in the explosion of a head bomb. Bedman also has an install super that enhances every error and makes his neutral and offense truly scary to deal with, but the duration on the install is quite short, only allowing for a few enhanced errors before it ends. On defense, Bedman struggles a little. With a long jump startup, no meterless reversal, an exceptionally slow metered reversal, and the drawback of losing your error state on hit or block, it can be tough to get the opponent off of you. That being said, Batman has the tools to perform in both neutral and on offense, and can effectively rely on system mechanics to escape block strings normally. Batman's combo structure can be a little rigid without errors, usually being simple button into special conversions, but gaining the error after these special move vendors is quite powerful as it lets Batman start his most powerful offense. If all of this sounds appealing to you, learn to play Batman, and you too can become Delilah's Swarm Protector. Asuka R. Kreutz is a man who needs no introduction. Years of fans asking for the legendary character, that man, the devil, the gear maker to be playable have finally come to fruition with perhaps the most difficult character Guilty Gear has ever seen. Asuka has the absolute most going on under the hood in the entire game, having to understand and manage three decks of 30 spells, with different numbers of each spell, a mana mechanic, a shield mechanic, pulling new cards, switching decks for different scenarios, and knowing what each individual spell does and how to use it most effectively. Asuka has easily the highest skill floor out of any character, but his skill ceiling seems galactic too. Every single one of Asuka's spells is incredibly powerful when used correctly, and not a single one is useless, giving him absolutely the bulkiest toolkit in the game. Asuka can use spells for everything. His spells are his combos. His spells are his overheads and lows. His spells are his pressure. His spells are his zoning. His spells are his fuzzies. His spells are his reversals. His spells are his resource management. His spells are his movement. His spells are his other spells. His spells are everything. It would be impossible to summarize everything Asuka's spells can do without making a separate video on this character alone, so pay close attention to the footage, which will showcase tons of unique use cases for every spell as I talk. Knowing how to use these spells is of utmost importance, and it's way more complicated than just spending the ones you have. Each spell costs a card from a deck. Each deck only has a certain amount of each card, and there are three decks with different cards in them. Test Case 1 has a lot of projectiles, but also has a few mix-up tools and economy spells, making it the most well-rounded deck. Test Case 2 has a lot of mix-up spells, and Test Case 3 has unique and powerful effect spells that change the course of the match, but lacks physical spells like projectiles. Asuka needs to draw more cards to get more spells, and every spell he casts and card he draws takes mana, but if Asuka plays too passive, the enemy can take his mana away by hitting him or dealing chip damage. While Asuka has mana, his health is among the highest in the game, but without mana, Asuka takes a massive plus 40% damage and gets locked out of all of his spells until he gets mana again. Asuka can only recover mana with specific economy spells as well as the recover mana special, but even that gets complicated. Asuka can choose to recover mana slowly at no cost, medium speed at the cost of meter, and fast at the cost of HP. Choosing the recovery method you want is very important due to how detrimental running out of mana is, combined with how equally important having meter and health is for obvious reasons. Pokes such as 2S and 5H have a use as mediocre neutral pokes. Asuka's 2D is a long-range projectile that hard knockdowns on hit and is incredibly fast to boot, rivaling the range of Giovanna's 2D while easily outspeeding it. 
This is an incredibly strong normal to check movement, so the opponent, and counter poke, but its weakness is that since it's a projectile, it doesn't become any more powerful on counter hit, and leaves Asuka in counter hit state himself. Asuka's offense depends on what spells he has, but almost every single projectile spell Asuka has is plus on block, meaning extended block strings as long as you have the right spells stored. Of note is 808, a powerful guard crush that wall bounces in the corner. Asuka's combo game is incredibly strong, with very good combos both spellless and especially so with spells, and in the right conditions these combos can allow Asuka to go resource even on both his mana and spell cards, as well as deal a large chunk of damage to the opponent, which is amazing as a character who cares so much about his resources. A core trait of Asuka's offense is what players are lovingly and sometimes not lovingly referring to as the Exodia combo. With the right combination of spells, it can be almost impossible to halt the momentum of Asuka's wizardry, so looking out for the most powerful spells and cashing them all in at once can be a powerful path to a guaranteed victory. Asuka really struggles on defense. Since he loses mana on any damage, whether it be chipped from specials or from getting hit, it can feel very threatening to have the opponent on top of you. Asuka has a reversal, but there's only one card in deck 1 and none in the other two. Additionally, Asuka completely lacks an invincible super, making his defense very subpar without use of YRC. That being said, Asuka's meter gain is very, very high. Casting spells builds meter, recovering cards builds meter, and making the opponent block builds meter, and you will be doing a lot of all of them. Asuka has great meter uses thanks to his ability to use RC to cover his much needed resources and his strong overdrives. High Compression Submicron Particle Sphere is a really long name for a fireball that is useful as a combo ender from long range and is a great tool to get hard knockdown on wall break, which Asuka really values. Bookmark Full Order is a very helpful super for deck management as it automatically fills Asuka's deck with spells and allows him to mill for whatever cards he wants. Asuka 100% has more than enough spells to get away with throwing some away, with three decks full of 30 cards, each for a total of 90 usable spells that all get refilled at the start of each round. If an incredibly challenging and currently underdeveloped character doesn't scare you, and an astoundingly vast toolkit with options for every scenario and then some sounds like the power you seek, open up your spellbook and look deep into the vast array of knowledge that is Asuka R. Woods. <laughs> With Season 3's release and the characters Johnny and Elfelt added to the game, this video will receive an addendum at the end of the season including all four characters from the season to ensure all characters have enough time to develop before the guides are created. Thank you very much for sticking around to the end of the video, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.